This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. Well, what a hell of a morning I have had. Greg Bedard, Greg Bedard's Patriots podcast with uh, Nick Cattles, brought to you by Athletic Greens, your one-stop shopping for 75 high-quality vitamins to help you start your day right. Greg, this will be a little bit of a quick edition of the pod. Let's start with Mac Jones. Uh, some rumblings about Jones, the relationship with Belichick, and the, the, the zappy stuff is still out there, and not being around the facility in February. And, and something that Zoe said that I wanted to go over and then get your thoughts on, uh, he said this yesterday, quote, I just hope he's in the building laying claim to what should be his, the way he should look at it. I don't want to give this back up an inch. He should be here installing with Billy, talking about Billy O'Brien every day. Uh, this is the offense. We're installing it. Let's get going. I'm just going to do it one-on-one with him. Billy, what are you doing? I'll be in at seven. You got time at seven. Let's go over things for a couple hours. We're not getting a lot of noise from that end of it. And normally I think we would with all the connections. So Zoe is saying that, that uh, Mac should be on the phone with Bill O'Brien, that they should be meeting every morning at 7 a.m. They should be going over the offense, installing it together. Um, th- there are some factual things that get in the way of, of Zoe's uh, thoughts here. Greg, I know you have a lot to say about this. So just uh, w- what were your thoughts on what Zoe had to say and, and kind of Mac not being around in February, if that's even possible? Yeah, so f- first of all, <clears throat> this is not a criticism of Zoe. I love Zoe. I think he's great at what he does, uh, both during the day and on Patriots broadcast. He's a friend. Um, I texted him about this yesterday because I heard the genesis of this is I heard the soundbite. It was played by Felger and Maz, and it struck me as odd because it's February. And uh, so, you know, we chatted a little bit, um, you know, about it. And, um, you know, and the other thing you need to remember is I'm, you know, Nick knows about it better than I do, but I do two hours of radio each week. You know, when you're doing live radio, sometimes you things come out um, incorrectly. You're not exactly precise. You know, that's why I'm a writer. I get to sit and choose my words carefully and say that's the way I want it. But when you're on air, sometimes things get lost in translation. Um, and sort of the genesis of this, I think, was a discussion about you know, there's a there's a lot of discussion about uh, you know can Mac Jones be tr- could Mac Jones be traded? Could they upgrade a quarterback? Aaron Rodgers is out there. You know, whatever. You know, that's the type of stuff going on. And there's also the backdrop of look. I don't think Bill Belichick was um, thrilled with Mac Jones this past season. From you know his turnovers to the way he acted, he didn't buy into the offense. Like I I don't think Bill loved that. I also don't think Bill indicted him or anybody else on offense because at the end of the day, even though Bill won't say it to us, which is a little bit disappointing because I think he'd go a long ways to sort of uh, smoothing things over in his own locker room. If he just came out and said like, look, I screwed up. I put everyone in a bad position. Matt Patricia, Joe Judge, Mac Jones, the whole offense. That was my fault. I I screwed up and we're going to get it fixed. I wish he would say that. He's not going to say that, but uh, I think I think Bill's basically giving everyone largely a pass on last year. So that's the genesis of this. But, you know, the talk about Mac Jones on whether he should be in the building and whether he can meet with the coaches, um, to me, quite frankly, is ridiculous. And, you know, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, it's February. It's the middle of February. Uh, contractually, and this sort of all changed around 2014. You know, back when Zolak played, uh, you know, the and, and he even mentioned this to me about how, like, you know, him and Brudso would shoot the crap with Ray Perkins in the offseason and stuff like that. Um, that stuff can't go on anymore. It changed in 2014. The rules are that the players are not required, and even then it's voluntarily, uh, on a, a voluntary basis, they're not they they aren't allowed in the building and to even come across their coaches until April 17th. That's for teams um with coaches who were there the year before. Teams with new coaches can go there uh a week ahead of time. Um <clears throat> now I do think Mac Jones can get the playbook from Billy O'Brien. I think they can exchange texts, thoughts, but you know nothing no sort of heavy lifting. And you know, yes, are there guys in the building right now lifting at the Patriots facility like Matt Slater? I think David Andrews is there. Um, 
you know, Bailey Zappi might even be there. I don't know. Yes, that happens. Yeah, that but, happens. but it happens more for, for, for guys who are married, established, have families, their kids are in school. So, so Foxborough is their home base basically year round, or at least during the school year. So they're allowed to go in. They can work a little bit with Moses Cabrera, the trainer, you know, the, the you know, who's in charge of um, the workouts and things like that. They can consult with him. And so you get that. But the younger guys in the league, single guys, Mac Jones, a lot of them, you know, have it already planned. All right, maybe we might make the Super Bowl. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my home base, wherever that is. And I'm going to work with my trainer. I'm going to work with my throwing coach for February and March up until then I can go to Foxborough and be around the team at least uh, four days a week when they're there during voluntary workouts. So, you know, to me, a lot of this stuff is just it's the genesis of it is there's nothing to talk about right now in Boston sports. Yeah, the Patriots have been done since very early January. The Bruins are rolling over everybody. They haven't made a move in the uh, uh, the trade deadline, and they're on the West Coast right now. The Celtics just went through the All Star break. They're rolling right now. Um, there's not much going on with them, and nobody cares about the Red Sox. I mean, nobody's down there. Nobody cares. The Red Sox look like they're going to stink. So, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about any sort of drama we can with the Patriots. Again, this is not a, a criticism of Zolak. I think he was just talking in generalities. But if anybody's concerned, there's no concern in the building if Mac Jones isn't there on an everyday basis in February. If we get to April and the voluntary program, like then you can sort of talk. But um, right now, to me, it's just sort of silly talk. Yeah, if you're watching this on YouTube, I apologize for not having video. As I mentioned, this morning has been a little bit of a challenge for me technically. Uh, but maybe it's a good thing you don't get to see this face. I do have a face for radio, so that's that's a good part of it, the whole thing. <laughs> Um, as far as look, I trust that Mac Jones cares, you know, the entire offseason narrative last year was how hard he was working. And you remember the, 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 the photo of him and I, I tweeted it out and it got tons of play. The, the, the picture of him that his girlfriend took or whatever, where he's flexing, uh, in the car window, everybody was talking about how hard he worked and how great he was. And, and the long kind of resume of, of his football career through high school and college. It's a dude who cares. He puts the work in and I'm not going to sit here and say that he's going to be working less. Am I supposed to believe that after the biggest year of, of struggles that he's had in the past few, Mm -hmm. it's a guy who won a national championship at Alabama and played balls out. He's a guy who played pretty damn good in his rookie season last year was a debacle. Am I supposed to believe that this guy that has always had work ethic and cares about what he does after the most challenging season of his early NFL career, he's just going to give up. He's he, this is the off season. He's going to care less. No, I'm sorry. He, he, I would imagine he's going to be like, yeah, th- this is my career. I, I have, I have pride. I have personal compete. I have a reputation to live by. I respect myself and the job I do. I respect my teammates. Oh, and let's not forget that after this year, there's a gigantic decision contractually the Patriots have to make. So Mac Jones has tens of millions, maybe even 100 to $150 million on the line this season. This guy has every reason to do everything that he has to do to be good this year. I'm not worried at all. With all of that said, Greg, is Mac in trouble with the Patriots in any way right now? I I, I really don't think so. I mean, you know, look, he... he, he you definitely don't know whether he's the guy yet, and he has to prove that. Um, you know, some people will say, like, you know, well, there's the playbook with Billy O'Brien. First of all, there, I, I don't know this, but I'm guessing that the playbook is largely going to go back to, you know, the bulk of what Josh McDaniels did, and Billy O'Brien will have his flavor on it, but he also needs to teach that to everybody. And I'm sure that we've already seen Mac Jones's trainer. Um, in early February, talking about posting a video of Mac Jones doing work, and and he made it sound like he's been at it for weeks. I'm sure he will get guys together to throw in the off season. Like he 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 knows, like you said, he knows this is a huge year for him. Um, I, I don't think he's in trouble. I think, um, you know, look, Robert Kraft when he went on Fox Business talked about you know how they had they they have a great young quarterback and how they're focused on his development. I don't think the owner 
who is uh, sort of gleefully taking a heavy hand in this offseason and is not afraid to point out where they've been, you know, weighing in as far as, you know, Billy O'Brien being back, Gerard Mayo being back. And then he goes on Fox Business and talks about Mac Jones. It, you know, if Bill Belichick was telling the owner, like, after this past season, like, look, I really didn't like Mac. I don't think he's the guy going forward. I think we're going to have to look at options. There's no way Robert Kraft, first of all, Belichick would give him some sort of hint in that regard. There's no way Belichick, uh, Kraft goes on Fox Business during Super Bowl week and talks about Mac Jones that way unless the organization is saying, at least for this season, we're moving forward with Mac, and then we'll see after the season when we have to make fifth-year option sort of decisions. So I think he's – I think everyone's disappointed about what happened last year, but I think everyone's largely getting a pass. And that includes Mac Jones first and foremost. And I think they're they're looking at a clean slate. Let's forget about last year. Let's go forward. And I think people will get excited about that. One last thing about Mac Jones before we move on to some team needs. And this would be close to the top of my wish list here over the next nine months or so. Just to stop the drama around this dude. Like, look, the, the reactions on the field and everything and what he did, we covered it. It should have been covered. It should have been talked about. At a certain point, it should have been criticized. But the nonstop, and some of this was expected because, yeah, Cam was the one that replaced, quote unquote, Tom Brady. But Mac is, Mac's the next guy, right? <clears throat> so to, to look at this and, and to, you know, just see the nonstop drama surrounding this guy it, it it's just it's a bit much it, it you mm -hmm. know it's like every other month it's something different it was you know the off season last off, last off season and what the the coordinator was was doing and and the whole offensive philosophy and all of that stuff then you got into the season and he got hurt then he was you know he was he was struggling the bailey zappy thing how belichick handled it on monday night so the whole world could see this play out in a terrible terrible way then, you know, he comes back and he doesn't play great right away. And it's the Bailey Zappi stuff again. And then he plays better, but the team loses and people still want to look at the quarterback. And then we get the Tom Brady stuff towards the end of the year where Tom might come back and that could happen. It, it, and now it's he's not at the facility. Can we just pump the gosh damn brakes about Mac Jones? Can everybody calm the hell down and take a deep breath? And let this dude have a normal offseason and training program with a coaching staff that knows its ass from its elbow. And then we'll watch him play football. And then we can decide whether or not he's a true future franchise QB1. Like, I'm just so tired of the nonstop Mac Jones BS. Let this dude work. Let this dude prove to the world that he's good enough. And if he does, he'll get paid. He'll be in New England. Like, I'm, it's, it's all this all these narratives circling around him. It, they Nobody's giving him a chance to breathe and just do his job. Like Belichick always says, do your job. Mac Jones has not been in a position for almost a full year now to just do his damn job. Let's see what happens when he's allowed to do that. That's my I tangent. Like it. I like it. <laughs> Before we get to uh, Tim, uh, team needs, let's uh, tell the fine people listening to this podcast and watching you on YouTube about Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 because I wanted to make sure I was getting all the vitamins and nutritional supplements I needed in one place. Now I've been on for seven months and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy, even though it's a, it's a green drink. People don't like green drinks. It kind of has a mild tropical taste, a little minty, and I actually look forward to it each morning. So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all the things you're looking for. Trust me, you drink it in the morning, you're going to feel like you got a shot of something and you feel much sharper. I take it first thing in the morning. It's now part of my daily routine and I'd be lost without it. I love how it contains less than one gram of sugar. No GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. Right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills, supplements, and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D. Very handy in New England during these winter months. And five free travel packs with your first purchase. 
All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Bedard. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Bedard to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, let's talk team needs uh, and, and maybe how to fill them, why you feel the way you feel. Greg, we'll start with uh, number five on your list. So we have the top five of Greg's list of team needs. We'll start from five down to one because I want to leave the last one as the most important. And uh, fifth on your list, Greg, of team needs this offseason is linebacker. Yeah, it's linebacker. And first of all, I just want to say that, you know, I prioritize this list might not. It's not like, you know, your fantasy football wish list. This is if the Patriots had to line up tomorrow, you know, they need this to do it because they do have pieces in place where they could compete and they do this or that. You know, so that's sort of the genesis of it. Um, you know, including, you know, number two on my list is starting offensive tackle and uh, Belichick doing Belichick things, just re-signed Connor McDermott to a yeah. two-year deal. Not that I think he's a starting tackle, and we'll get to that in a second, but that sort of thing. And so number five for me is linebacker. I think we've been over it before on the pod. Um, you know, when I look back at last year and I look at where this defense has been since 2019, since the end of 2019, they got old and slow. Your defense is only as fast as your inside linebackers and the Patriots. You know, Jawan Bentley's okay. He's solid. Um, you know, but, you know, Jelani Tavai, good, solid player, versatile. But to me, he's more of a backup, fill in different spots where you need on a matchup basis. The Patriots need some sort of athletic linebacker against these faster teams. The linebackers do not play well against the better offenses that they face. They need to get more athletic. I don't care if it's smaller, Belichick's got to evolve at that spot. But number so number five for me is linebacker. I'd have linebacker likely a little higher on my list because I just think the impact, if you could really find an athlete, could change this defense. And I thought you did a great job, Greg, about a week or two ago, writing about this defense against good offenses and, and the clear difference when you look at the numbers and a lot of those good offenses that they had trouble with. We've talked about this over and over and over again the last few years mobile athletic quarterbacks, teams that are quick as well, sideline to sideline. And I just think a, a linebacker with athleticism could really, really impact this defense in a great way. Number four on your list, Greg. So it's cornerback, and a lot of people will be like, wait a minute, Bedard, I thought you wanted to like trade for Jalen Ramsey, and you say how you know a number one cornerback, if they brought one in, some really good lockdown cornerback would make the Patriots a lot better on defense. Yes, I believe that. But I also look at the roster and realize that as of today, they could line up with Jalen Mills, Jack Jones, and Marcus Jones at the least. And that's if Jonathan Jones, you know, leaves in free agency. You know, they're not they're not dead in the water at cornerback. I think Jalen Mills has a couple years left on his deal. The the uh, the Jones boys, of course, are rookies, so they're going to be around. Um, they showed they certainly flashed as rookies, and I expect them to develop. So I'm not. While I want a number one cornerback, I'm not, I'm not overly desperate. Um, you know the way sort of Belichick looks at things, and so, but I definitely want one. I think if if you if you uh, get a number one cornerback, like say you know say you trade for Jalen Ramsey, it's not that big of a deal in terms of draft pick compensation, considering the Rams just want the money off the books. I don't know. Maybe it is a lot of compensation. We'll see. But say it's not. And you can tack on a couple dummy years to sort of, um, you know, minimize his capped impact, you know, and then again, the Patriots have to evaluate him. If the Patriots look at him and say he has another two to three years left as a top lockdown cornerback, I think that's the best thing for the Patriots because you put him out there. The Patriots have always been their best when they've had a lockdown guy in one of the spots and they haven't had that. And it's sort of hurt them in recent years. You saw Jonathan Jones this year. Um, you know, out of his depth as a number one cornerback uh, down the stretch. And I think if they get that guy and can slot everybody one slot lower, then I think the Patriots have a chance to be, you know, a, a pretty darn good defense this year. I'd slide cornerback up a few spots. I'd love a true number one shutdown corner. I don't trust Jalen Mills as a corner. Never have, never will. Um, he's had his hits and his misses. He had trouble staying on the field last year. He's not getting younger like all of us. And, you know, Jack Jones with the off the field stuff in college and then what happened at the end of the year. I don't know if I, I trust him to be my true yep. number two guy. 
So I, I think adding that cornerback, if you could find, I mean, Ramsey would be fantastic, but a true number one corner would be great, whether it's through drafts, free agency, or trade. Number three, Greg, on your list. Number three is tight end, and I'm sure a lot of people won't agree with that, but m- my thinking is this. Look, Hunter Henry's going into the last year of his deal. Um that he didn't get a renegotiation last year or even a contract extension tells me that he's looking to go to free agency again. So let's just play this out. They go through the year. Hunter Henry doesn't want a contract extension. He's, he bets on himself that he can you know hit free agency and, and be desired. Um, the Patriots are left with Jonu Smith on the roster uh, because they can't get rid of him because of his contract, at least this season. They could after the season. Right now... They don't have anything at tight end beyond this year. So to me, it's vital that they get some sort of tight end at some point who, you know, could, with a year of development, um, be sort of a solid guy. It looks like there's a lot of tight ends in this draft. That's the way I would like to do that. Um, You know, 14, it's possible. Maybe especially if the Patriots trade down for 14, if they don't like what's there, they might be able to get, you know, there's Meyer, there's a kid, uh, I think, from the West Coast. There's, There's a bunch of... Uh, top prospects at tight end, but I definitely think it's a need for this team because I'm not leaving myself short uh, going into the next year. Look, I'm a Notre Dame fan. Uh, Michael Mayer is fantastic. I think he's going to go in the top 15 of this draft. He he might be right around there for the Patriots. I don't hate the idea of adding a tight end. It would not be in my top three personally. I think you can survive and, and maybe even thrive with Henry and Smith this year. But I do like the idea of drafting one, if not two tight ends. I, I don't know if I'd spend, you know, you know, high draft picks, maybe third round, mid rounds. Um, yeah, but let's I, do the Devin Aussie Aussie Keen thing again. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> well, I, I, I trust, I trust Bill O'Brien. I do. I, I think he'll get more out of these tight ends this year. So I, I don't think it's as urgent to be in my top three. But I, I get your philosophy and, and theory and and kind of hypothetical play out there, especially with Hunter and his his contract. All right, number two on your list. By the way, let me give you a quickie story on that, Bill O'Brien and tight ends, because I heard him clinic once on the Patriots' two tight end offense, and they told the story about how going into that offseason, you know, they Belichick always gives the coaches, like, uh, a project to do. So Billy was part of the project to find – they wanted to get two young tight ends. They wanted more tight ends. They wanted – they wanted to move in that direction with the offense. And so they evaluated all the college prospects. And O'Brien told the story about how, like, they were all in agreement. They all liked Hernandez. Uh, but he, O'Brien admitted he did not have Gronkowski in his whatever top three or whatever. And he was like, thank God Belichick did. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a little bit of a tangent and fun fact for you. Uh, number two is starting offensive tackle. I think that's pretty obvious. They re-signed Connor McDermott. I think Field Yates reported it's like two years, three point six million. That's basically a little bit more than the league minimum, uh, which I'm hoping. Uh, for those of you not watching the video, I'm crossing my fingers. Like, please, like, like he's not going to be a starter, is he, Nick? He's not. He they're not, not penciling him. <laughs> I mean, you know. But I understand. Bill always does this. He always wants to go into the off season with all of the that, that they're not completely desperate at any spot that they basically have somebody they could go to in a pinch if needed bill always does this it helps keep other teams from uh figuring out what direction they're going to go to whether in free agency or the draft so i understand the mcdermott thing i saw i figured that was going to happen um but they got to get they got to get a young rising offensive tackle i'm fine with trent brown i thought he was better last year than most people did hopefully clem can improve him and the rest of the line. I'd love Trent Brown at right tackle and bring in a franchise left tackle, a young guy on a rookie deal. That would be my ideal. I don't know whether they're going to be able to do that or not. It's possible in the draft. Um, I'm not going free agency for a starting tackle. Hell no. Like, I did not just pay Adrian Clem that money to, you know, go pay, you know, $15 million for McGlinchey, you know, an average right tackle for the 49ers. I ain't doing that. Um, I'm getting a guy in the draft. I'm saying if Adrian Clem is as good as I think he is because of the contract I just gave him, he better develop a young offensive tackle. And you have Trent Brown who could start at left tackle for you anyway. So I'm definitely going via the draft. 
starting offensive tackle is my number one need. It's at the top of my list. Uh, Trent Brown has one year left, I believe, on his contract. Yep. Even with McDermott, the depth is thin unless you believe just can stick. And, you know, he was okay last year. I, I think you've got to draft a, an offensive tackle, legit guy in the top two rounds. I, I don't think you wait around and, and see if somebody falls to you. It's It's that much of a need to me. And I wouldn't even hate the idea of drafting two offensive tackles in this draft. Again, one yeah. guy who's a stud and then maybe somebody that you could develop. Greg, your number one offseason need for this football team. It's free safety just because at the moment they don't have one. I think, you know, I think this spot's going to stay open for a while. I think Devin McCourty said on a podcast with Christopher Price that he is um, – you know, this is part of the process. He's going on vacation. He's still thinking about it. He's going to visit with his brother. He's undecided. But I think that really free safety, if you look at the Patriots depth chart now that McDermott signed, free safety is the only spot on the team where, in theory, they can't line up tomorrow. Um, to me, that says that they're waiting on McCourty's decision, and then they're going to make a decision. I think that, uh, in my mind, you know, my preference for sort of filling out the secondary right now, uh, depending on the draft and also what happens in free agency, is I'm getting a number one cornerback like we talked about, and I'm moving Jalen Mills to free safety, something that he did with the Eagles. I don't know how good he can be there. You know, I know that's part of the reason why they signed him to the contract that he did, because he sort of covered them in a, a couple of different spots. I don't think they have any. Miles Bryant is another possibility, but I think he's too small. They have too many strong safeties on this team. Kyle Duggar, Adrian Phillips, Jabril Peppers is a free agent that maybe they bring back. Those guys are all strong safeties. They don't have many free safeties. So my preference is for McCourty to come back and play another year because I still think he's good enough um, and maybe get the next guy ready because here we are again, another position where the Patriots don't have a ready uh, succession plan, just like this is like seven straight years that we've been going through this. Uh, but I think Mills gives you the possibility, and uh, that's where I am at that position right now. Yeah, it would not be my top need. Uh, I'd have it down a few slots just because of what you just mentioned and brought up the idea of you know Jalen Mills being able to slide back there. Jonathan Jones has talked about his versatility. You know, he, he might even be an option if you bring him back it, it, for reasonable money. So I think there's a way to fill that need. I, I don't have the the urgency there as much as some other spots. One more spot that I would bring up. Uh, is wide receiver, especially if you don't bring back Jacoby Myers. I, I don't know what's going to happen with Kendrick Bourne this year after last year. Um, Devontae Parker's a great, you know, contested catch guy down the field. I, I don't think he's a true number one. I don't know what to expect from Tyquan Thornton. I'm hoping for the best. I just think there's a lot of questions at receiver. Even if you bring Myers back, I, I would love for them to bring in somebody who's a, a, a legitimate game changer, a true number one receiver for their quarterback. I, I would love to see it. I don't know if it's going to happen, but that would be uh, near the top of my list. All right, let's get to the uh, BSJ member question of the day, Greg. Uh, a lot of stuff to talk about, obviously. There's free agency coming up, team needs, Mac Jones. What do you got? So one of our members uh, that uh, will remain nameless because he's actually um, – uh, uh, Let's see, he's 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 in the mix uh, as far as like union people and the NFLPA and stuff like that. So I don't want to totally add him. But he was listening to my solo pod from last week. Uh, we missed you under the weather last week, Nick. Um, and he sort of took issue with my criticism that I, I basically said I, I hate free agency. And I do. I mean, it's fun to talk about and it's fun, silly season. And, you know it can help you get back to contention right away. But in general, I feel that uh, a lot of it is you're dealing with other people's trash. I mean, look at Johnny Smith, the Titans let him go for a reason. The Patriots snatched, snatched him up. He hasn't really done anything here. You know, then again, other guys do pay off. I mean, you know, Hunter Henry's been decent, you know, so there are always exceptions. So I don't completely hate it, but he, he you know, he said something, he said, I disagree strongly about the harm and bringing, in free agents, I definitely think there's a way to do it by taking a tons of swings in free agency. First Super Bowl offseason, Mark Anderson offseason uh, was a great example. And my response to that was, yes, you know, veteran, when they went, the Patriots went from 2000 to 2001, they brought in a ton of free agents. So they sort of filled in the gap 
uh, with veteran guys under the radar type guys. And even Mark Anderson, Andre Carter, that year, they did that. The problem is, is those, those were special circumstances. Okay. First of all, you know, free agency back then was a lot different in, in 2000, 2001. Now it has changed. First of all, there's a lot more cap space available and a lot of guys get locked up franchise, stuff like that. Even before they hit a lot more guys became available back then. Also, teams with analytics and things like that now they're all keyed in you it's hard to it's hard to really mine a diamond in the rough now all these analytics departments and front offices are all after the same players they all see sort of the inequities in the market they're all sort of targeting the same thing and then the other thing about the mark anderson andre carter offseason remember that was after the lockout that was a unique situation where all these free agents flooded the market at the same time limited cap space, things like that. And the Patriots were able to pluck a few guys who really, you know, helped them, um, at least in the short term. So, uh, you know, I, I understand the appeal of free agency. I, I would just, you got to build through the draft. And then you pepper in free agents here and there. You can't you can't add a bunch in one offseason and totally change your franchise the Patriots improved themselves two years ago when they did that, but it was still limited at the end of the day. He's Greg. I'm Nick. It's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles brought to you by Athletic Greens. We'll keep an eye on the news. Anything breaks, we'll be on it. Uh, until next week, everybody be good. Stay, uh, stay warm and uh, stay healthy. We'll talk to you then. 